Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second half of today's New Horizons, where we're going to be inspired for the work that we're doing over the course of the next four days and beyond. And welcome to anyone who's just joining us, maybe because you have been asleep when we started, unlike Julie, who was just giving us her keynote at four in the morning. It's uh, great to have already 500 people um, active on Platz and 300 in Wysembly. Thank you so much for answering my questions and giving us questions that we can give to our panelists and our speakers. And remember, when you're using Wysembly, just write anything you want to ask. And if you see a question or a comment that you would like to support, press the like button. We all know that from the social media we've just been talking about. And it will rise to the top of our list and we can broach those questions, which we will be doing in the panel discussion right now. But perhaps let's just, just really um, have a look at where we are in our overall space journey um, as we go forward. Um, we've seen that GIZ is certainly not starting from scratch. There is a lot of, um, a lot of projects, initiatives, ideas that are either in that incubation phase or are already being measured their impact is being measured, which is an exciting place to start from. We've seen that there's a great deal of confidence in the room in looking forward as to how GIZ and international cooperation and development can also shape this global transformation, the digital transformation. But it's not everyone who shares that confidence. There's still a lot that we need to learn, a lot that we need to do. And I think what Julia has helped us uh, understand is this, this local approach. We need to understand the contexts we're in. We need to have those negotiations of what is freedom ex of expression, what is hate speech. But there's been quite a lot of sceptical questions also coming in um, saying, you know, how much control do we need and how much openness can we afford to have when dealing with um, authoritarian uh, governments and countries? What about data protection? What about citizen surveillance? Um, these are all questions that we still need to find answers for. Um, and basically, we're always asking that one fundamental question, what's the role of GIZ? What's the role of international cooperation and development in moving forward? And now we are on to our panel discussion. The panel discussion is entitled New Opportunities of Digital Transformation to Promote, to promote Good Governance and Peace Building. So this is where we're bringing in the whole context of peace building into our discussion. And um, Catherine Lawrence will be moderating the panel. You'll meet the panelists uh, very shortly. And that will take us up to 15.45 when there'll be an opportunity for you to refuel again. And I can all, I can already promise you that you're going to be pleasantly surprised by our all-female panel. So now over to you, Katrin. Keep your questions coming in on Wysembly. Thanks, Natasha. And uh, we are already getting warm here in the studio. <laughs> and we're also hoping, of course, for lively and hot discussions and debate with our panelists and everyone else out there. So I had to take off my jacket and uh, to get ready and to roll up my sleeves uh, somehow <laughs> that are not there for this panel. Great to see you. We have an all-female panel. It was said before. Uh, as uh, we mentioned, Eleanor B before, and we see often huge parts of society are left out in discussions, sometimes maybe in particular on digital transformation, but then again, maybe not, as we can see here from our champions and pioneers. But um, to, uh, to make a statement here, we actually invited these five fearless women for our all-female panel today at the Future Forum. And uh, so you summarized already a little bit what was said before in our sessions that we've been having since 12.30. Today, now, this is the session, the panel is to bridge towards the discussions that we will continue having later on today, but also on Tuesday and Wednesday, which is more in the internal GIZ sphere, where we have decided to discuss our huge topic on peace building, governance, but also displacement, crisis, inequalities, etc., along four thematic broad areas. And uh, so these are the four areas. And you met earlier already the champions who have organized the discussions in these four thematic areas. It's digital capacities, social cohesion and peace building in the digital age, inclusive digital democracy and deliberation, and data for sustainable development. So our panel is shaped in a way that we also pick up these corridors, these thematic corridors, uh, in this discussion, but of course, any questions coming in that go beyond 
our corridors. Uh, we will, of course, try to include in our discussion and I will ping pong these questions to our panelists. So be prepared. And uh, with that, I'd like to start um, with introducing our distinguished panel today. So let me start with Dorothy Stark. She is head of division gender and inequality at our main commissioning party from the German government, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. Great to see you and uh, great having you, Dorothy. And we then have Helani Galpaya. She is uh, the CEO. Oh, now I scrolled down too much, uh, uh, Helani. Uh, of uh, a think tank research institution, Linear Asia. Maybe with your first intervention, you can tell us a little bit about what this institution is doing. And you're also involved in the Global Partnership of Sustainable Development Data. And uh, our next panelist is Janira Sambuli. She is an activist and she's also affiliated with the Digital Impact Alliance, which uh, what I really liked is a think, do, and Replicate Tank, housed at the UN Foundation. And uh, we've heard a lot this morning already about us as GIZ trying to, of course, think, but also do implement and scale, which is what we use uh, as a word here. So we can learn, I'm sure, not only thematically, but also institutionally a lot from, from your work. Welcome, Najira. And uh, then we also have a representative from Smart Africa. Um, maybe in uh, the online program, you still see uh, Thelma. Quay, as, uh, as the person representing Smart Africa, um, we have today Aretha Mare, who works with uh, Smart Africa, which is an initiative by the heads of African countries to accelerate socioeconomic development towards the knowledge economy. So really glad to have you here, Aretha, and, and hear from you. And uh, then let me finally uh, introduce uh, Tracy Mary Lane. She is a practice manager, public administration at the World Bank. I think I don't have to say any words about the World Bank. Um, but we're also, of course, keen to hear uh, you had a seminal report this year, the WDR on data for better lives. So also, of course, next to our questions, we are interested in, in that experience and how you got there. So great to have you and um, I hope everybody's connection is as well so we can start our, our panel. And as I said, I'd like to start with the first block that is around the issue of digital capacities. And um, in order, you will see that in a minute, in order to make our questions more even coming in from uh, our colleagues from all over the world, we had pre-recorded all the questions. You see it in the second uh, slot, our first block. Uh, this is Nikolai, and uh, for technical reasons, we cannot show his video. You'll see more videos later, but let me quickly read out his question to you. And my first questions I'd like to address to Aretha and Tracy. So Nikolai is our colleague from Indonesia, and he had prepared these great questions related to his work. He works in the context of anti-corruption, and together with his partners, he developed the Diaga app, which helps people to get full transparency on services by government or to report corruption anonymously and safely. So a great achievement already. Nikolai, however, from his work has two observations, questions he'd like to share with the panel and get your insights. The first is that the uh, interaction remains a challenge due to the capacity deficits, in particular of the governmental officials, but not only, and this he experiences at all levels. So the first question to Aretha goes into that direction. What is the first thing that needs to be done to support government officers to deliver good digital services to citizens? His second question, so I'll pick it up later again, is about the gap between digital capacities and mandates and capacities for change processes within organizations. But I'll take that later. So Aretha, happy to hear from you. What's the first thing that needs to be done to support government officers to deliver good good digital services to the citizens. Thank you very much, Katrina. Uh, before I respond to your question, let me just uh, briefly introduce uh, myself. Um, um, the project manager responsible for data governance uh, projects at Smart Africa. And I'm here, like you mentioned, on behalf of Thelma, who's the head of uh, digital infrastructure. Thank you very much uh, for organizing this forum and also for inviting uh, Smart Africa. Uh, so to respond to your question, I think uh, it is very important for us to prioritize building capacity of those that are responsible for rolling out these digital services. So uh, what do I mean by this? Um, so whether we are looking at it from a strategic point of view or it's about implementation, 
we need um, government officials who have uh, skills in this area, one, so that they can have the ability to analyze and focus technological trends. They also need to understand um, the application and also the implications of uh, adopting imaging technologies. It is also important to develop digital services uh, that meet uh, the needs of the intended users. So the ability to build tools that fulfill this need and also are use, easy to use. Also the ability to quickly adapt as technology evolves. And as I've mentioned, all these require some level of digital skill uh, to be able to understand the dynamics around digital technologies. There are also other critical elements apart from capacity building, but I'll center on capacity building uh, for now. So for a Smart Africa, uh, we are constantly engaging with uh, Smart Africa member states to understand what their needs and priorities are. So we have um, some projects and initiatives that are currently ongoing at Smart Africa. One of them is the Smart Africa Digital Academy, which offers tailored uh, capacity building and training to decision makers. So far, 600 policymakers have been trained. We also have uh, the Africa Data Leadership Initiative, uh, which is a peer learning and engagement network for data practitioners across the continent. Um, and members um, include government officials from mid to senior level, also from different agencies, for example, statistical institutions, as well as data protection authorities. We also have um, some participants from private sector, academia, and civil society. And why is this important? So far, we have about 32 African countries that have enacted data protection laws. But you find that uh, these African countries are at varying levels of implementation, some more advanced than others, and others are just starting. So we believe it's important to uh, to for these countries to be learning uh, from each other. Um, as Smart Africa, we do not want to reinvent the wheel, but what we want to do is support the coordination efforts on the continent and also to help African countries to learn from each other. So yes, um, I think we need to prioritize capacity building. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you. Maybe to add one further question, Aretha, if you can elaborate a little more. Um, do you work with those who are already digitally very literate and built up on those capacities? Or do you target specifically on the strategic level more the management side and make them maybe more open for, for the digital transformation? Maybe you can share an insight from, from your organization. And I'd also like to uh, ping pong this question then over to Tracy um, to maybe elaborate a little more. So yes, from uh, my work uh, within the data governance projects, we are working with uh, people that already have some level of understanding, but then there are specific needs. For example, you find with data protection authorities, there's a mismatch between existing regulatory frameworks and their enforcement. So we tailor the training according to their needs and demands. Tracy, what's, what's your experience in this regard? Um, What's the best way to bring together maybe these digital natives who are ready for the digital transformation in their institutions with sometimes decision makers that maybe um, and who know the change management processes in their institutions that just may not be so ready yet for this kind of transformation? What's your experience? Thanks. I think uh, it's important to note that the government also needs to attract um, digital natives inside to the public sector. And this is this is a big challenge. These skills are obviously very scarce um, in, in the counterparts that we're dealing with. And the public sector can't compete on salary alone. So it's about making sure the value proposition of being in the public sector and the other benefits of, of being there to make a difference. Um, there's also security of tenure. Uh, but mostly, I think you need to then deliver on, on the expectations of being able to get a, get a job that does allow you to make a difference. And that means changing the culture of of the public sector, something that uh, is really very difficult to do, but critical. So things like having an innovative culture, um, having leaders who understand um, the benefits of some of this digital transformation that we're talking about. So we don't uh, have digital natives then get bogged down in the traditional bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds like a long-term uh, task uh, to change the culture of public sector institutions <laughs> without saying too much. Sometimes at GIZ, of course, uh, we may feel reminded of that. Uh, I think we're on a very good way and we have this space now at the Future Forum. 
But uh, what's your what's your observations on changing culture and uh, the long term? The, I think the long breath one needs to have. And uh, the, also, I'm already looking at Natasha because we are in five minutes, maybe rounding up this first uh, round of questions. If there's something on Vicemly, we can take this. But first of all, changing culture in public institutions. Tracy. Oh, and back to me. So back to you. It is a long, yeah, it is a long-term <laughs> endeavor. You're absolutely right. But I think we have to start with the nuts and bolts around mm. how we recruit in the public sector. So mm. it sounds like a, you know, an old uh, um, uh, advice, but merit-based recruitment is is key, and uh, promotion and retention based on performance is is fundamental. So I think overcoming some of these hurdles about how to attract, how to retain, how to manage for performance, I think these are really at the root of changing the culture inside. Mm. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, let's look at Y Assembly. Um, do we have well, any questions coming in on that particular question? We've, we've, we've got quite an interesting discussion going on, but okay. it's mostly about having an all-female panel, which is obviously <laughs> something which people are, are quite gobsmacked about. They love it, but there, there's also a discussion on um, positive discrimination. So we'll, uh, keep 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 going down there. But it's obviously <laughs> something that people are going, "Wow, this is totally different." <laughs> so continue. Good, yeah, at least we got the attention for this. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, I looked, of course, uh, at everybody's uh, background and I mentioned it before the think do and replicate tank uh, digital impact alliance Nigeria uh, what's your experience with um, building digital capacities where do you see bottlenecks what could be an advice also for organizations like us uh, who work with public sector institutions mm -hmm. to to make this capacity development happen Yeah, the culture thing is really the secret sauce uh, because that's the determinant regardless of whichever capac technical capacity element you'll be trying to train for. Um, and, we, you know, uh, with organizations like Dial, uh, the Digital Impact Alliance, who try and work with governments over time to shape both policies and the, the smart procurement of digital technologies, you can imagine that the moment you move from one particular technology to a new one that's perhaps more efficient and all that. The key determinant of success is going to be the culture of learning and unlearning that has already been inculcated. The willingness for folks to tinker um, and learn new things in a first place environment is really the determinant. And usually it's interesting when we talk about these issues on capacity because everybody just assumes it's this technical thing. You keep people training and in courses, but it really goes back to this soft stuff that makes uh, for cultures and how people work together the kind of mindset that is enabled and empowered in a particular workspace, be it in public sector or in any other sector. But, you know, focusing on the public sector, there is work to be done within GIZ, BMZ, and other governments and similar agencies, from the way things have worked in bureaucracies to how they will work in a world where technologies necessitate things moving faster and efficiency is a different metric um, than before. So I would say it really comes back down to culture. Excellent. Thanks so much. And it reminds me, without repeating what Katrin Vogel said word by word earlier, but it's about this learning culture and it's about this openness also um, to, to fail. That's maybe also part of the culture, taking risks. But we have questions coming in. Yeah, well, there's, there's a comment here, which I think is important because it's taking a little bit of the pressure off the public sector and saying, you know, they're, they're like the dumb ones that need to, to, to be educated. Um, someone says digital solutions are built by people working in the digital economy. They're not tailored to the needs of public authorities. So more exchange is needing between the sectors. Mm -hmm. I think this was also a point that was raised by uh, Katharine and Bjorn very strongly, the partnerships point. Great. Uh, thanks for this first round. Um, let's look towards the second round, uh, which is on social cohesion and peace building in the digital era. This time, our digital means worked. <laughs> and we do have one of our participants from this focus area who will be digging deeply tomorrow and the day after tomorrow to work on these issues, uh, posing a question. And we pre-recorded this question. And I think it's Mona who will join us. Can someone show the video? Excellent. Hi, my name is Mona and I'm project manager for transitional development assistance projects. Our first question goes to Dorothy. GIZ actively supports gender equality and equal access to information and technology through its projects, both in stable and also in fragile and conflict affected contexts. However, we still see a huge digital divide between men and women. 
For example, 234 million fewer women than men currently have access to the mobile internet, according to the Global Mobile Operator Association, GSMA. Where does BMZ see the highest investment needs for German and international cooperation to ensure that no one gets left behind in this phase of digital transformation? Our second question goes to Nanjira. Ten years ago, social media played an important role for the mobilization of peaceful protests in the context of the so-called Arab Spring. In recent discussions, the role of social media is increasingly seen rather as a danger to peaceful coexistence due to examples where online polarization led to offline physical violence. You are serving on the advisory board of the Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms and are a fellow of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. What is the greatest threat to peace hailing from digital technologies from your point of view? How can GIZ reduce conflict risks of digitalization and strengthen the peace-promoting potentials of technology? Great questions from uh, Mona, representing our uh, thematic area on social cohesion and peace building. So, uh, Dorothy, uh, what's the most important area for BMZ you would recommend investing in so that uh, the digital transformation does not worsen the divides, which has really been a topic already throughout the day, the digital divide? Dorothy, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Katrin, and thank you um, to the organizers also for for having me here. Um, it's always very humbling to to um, be in the same conferences with with practitioners and people that are much closer to to our partners uh, than we are as uh, uh, in, in in the ministries <laughs> in Bonn or Berlin. So um, thank you also for the question. Of course, this, this is very important um, to tackle that famous digital divide. We all know that uh, changing a mobile phone is uh, not really um, a luxury these days, but really life-changing and uh, it enables social participation, economic participation and political participation. So the gender um, divide here is a, is a real problem that, that we need to tackle. When you ask about what is the most important um, area to invest in, I am afraid I don't have a clear answer because, of course, <laughs> the problem uh, is manifold, and in essence, we need to we need to um, approach this uh, holistically and work on different points at the same time. So we have the essentials, of course. You need to to own a mobile phone. And you have to have the skills to use it. So owning a mobile phone is about uh, having the financial resources, having the financial freedom to purchase the device and purchase the services. This is about economic empowerment of uh, women and girls. Second, the skills. You have to know how to use it. This is about uh, uh, bringing the skills to, to women and girls um, in all their diversity and uh, and and. Um, Having having more uh, women also uh, being familiar with this um, area of work, but as as Najira, I mean, she she was much more um, eloquent than I could have done. It's all about the cultural source. I think you said I mean, we need to look at the struct structural causes of ex exclusion of um, women, and girls, and it's not it is not a, a mere target group approach where you fix a thing. So we know about the structural causes of exclusion of women, and we, we need to tackle these as well. So we need an enabling environment. We need to have uh, achievability, accessibility. And uh, just to give you one example, um, 20% of women who don't use um, digital services uh, do, um, don't, don't use them because they don't have a bank account, and you need a bank account. So this is one structural um, element of an enabling environment that, uh, that is important. Then, of course, the general level of education of women and girls is still lagging behind, and that can also play a, a role. And then, of course, there's these cultural reasons, which we um, always uh, 
call we need to have an, a transformative a gender transformative approach so if you s perceive the internet as something male dominated and traditionally made for men as a provider and as a targeted user you will hesitate to use it actively so we need to change the mindsets and uh, try to change cultural norms um let me add two more elements to these uh, to these areas so the first is that we need to get more women and girls also to to become designers of technical technologies and to Im involve them into into uh, this male dominated branch and um, the last uh, thought that i have because uh, my unit is not only um uh, mandated with human rights and gender equality, but also with the inclusion of uh, persons with disabilities. So if women are often um, discriminated against and as a disadvantage, uh, people with disabilities are even more so. And we have these intersecting uh, discriminations, which we need to think together. Um, uh, women with uh, disabilities are even more at disadvantage. So um, we need to we need to really approach this holistically and um, try to uh, really target those most left behind and um, suffering from, from different sources of, of disadvantage. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dorothy. And uh, I really liked, we talked about earlier also about uh, how The, of course, the virtual world and the real world are interconnected. And uh, as you were saying, um, sometimes we reproduce these structural inequalities in the digital world. And this is definitely something where we need structural answers. We have right. a question coming in from... Well, I, I guess it's basically um, what you've just spoken to, um, Dorothy. Um, someone says, in social cohesion and peace building, human interaction plays an important role to establish trust, cooperation and confidence between partners, both state and non-state actors. And the person asks, how can we ensure that digital technologies and platforms can achieve this goal? And I loved your answer, basically saying, include them in making right. these platforms in the first place and that can also make build this trust and confidence i guess mm. thank you thank you i, I think uh, we turn to najira um, directly so you heard mona's question about uh, the threats and risks to peace through digital technologies what's your experience what do you observe and what's maybe your advice to give to us one can speak at length about <laughs> what happens as, as far as this topic goes but um, let me try and take the way Mona framed it, um, the greatest threat to peace, social cohesion brought on by digital technologies is actually a misunderstanding of the problem at hand. And by that, I mean that technologies, as far as they go, will always amplify the intrinsic motivation of their users. So if there are people who are using these technologies in ways that are threatening peace or are showing some sort of uh, disquiet or dis, you know, sort of uh, dissatisfaction with their society. It's a signal of a much bigger issue than the technology at hand. Granted, the technologies themselves are under governance mechanisms that are not really within social reach in many ways for many of us. We're dealing with social media platforms that are not necessarily accountable to the contexts in which they play out differently. And that's a different conversation. But for those of us who are trying to make sense of what is happening in different societies and different communities, the most critical thing to remember is that it's not the technologies themselves that have made people more, more prone to uh, stoking uh, conflicts or sowing seeds of discord. It is actually a symptom of something deeper and probably that has not had outlets in the offline world or in civic spaces elsewhere that people are leveraging these technologies to bring um, to, to, to light, however, however uh, we cut across it, whether it's valid or not, and depending on who's the arbiter of that. And so for those who are building programs like GIZ, I would say the most important thing you can do is make sure that whatever programs you call digital peace building, bring in those who've been working in the social aspects of, in the offline world, those who've been working in development aspects with communities, those who are looking at how technologies are shaping um, up, how they're governed, how algorithms are determining what we see, what we don't see, and bring all those things together to analyze this issue. We risk a lot by going into a silo and saying this is just solely a digital issue. No. Online, offline, online is this cycle that we need to understand better. And what we are seeing online is a mirror of what's happening offline. And maybe the question is, have we not been listening to what's happening in communities around the world? 
thank you very much. I see questions coming in. Loads There's of loads questions of questions. Now, now people, are, people are really warm. I mean, <laughs> the, the, there's a question here. Are we witnessing a rise of authoritarianism that's based on the power of digital surveillance? And what can actors such as GIZ do to support an approach of cyber security that's human-centered and supports the protection of human rights? Huh. It's a interesting. <laughs> Nadira, maybe I'll first uh, I'll go the other yeah. way around now in this little block, but also Helani, who hasn't spoken yet, uh, anyone else who wants to come in, but maybe Nadira, if you want to have a first uh, reflection on this question, please go ahead. <laughs> there are tools that are helping the authoritarian agenda become much easier to, to advance, for sure. Uh, but I want to just, again, lean back to it's not just because of the technologies. These technologies are serving an intrinsic motivation. It's not because technologies are built and somebody suddenly thinks, who, you know what I could do? There's something bigger about what they could already do and technologies is making it possible for them. So a question I would maybe also have uh, into the round is... Um so who do we partner with also to work on these technology developments if some technologies actually bring this negative mm -hmm. intrinsic intention, uh, intention forward? Helani, please, jump in. Yeah, I, I, I think the group that hasn't been talked about is who we, a lot of us represent, and that is civil society, right? Often, the technology is developed by private sector, implemented by govern governments, and surveyed and imposed upon people. Civil society then is in the role of, in the end, trying to hold governments to account. This is a rather negative, vicious cycle which poses these people against each other. Funders should really insist on any technology development and adoption by government having civil society from the beginning to the end from the time of conceptualization and design, as has been talked about, to implementation, boring stuff like sitting on procurement panels, having ethics panels with civil society, then ground truthing the implementation with civil society to understand the impacts and feeding that back. Second, a government that is seriously embarking on digitization without developing the capacity of that civil society in that country to engage in that process is not very serious, I think. So they, their capacity has to be developed so they can do all the things like sitting on those committees. Third, funders and governments need to pay civil society to do this. Right. I mean, often civil society is asked to come for meetings, sit on panels all on free time while the government employees are being paid and the private sector uh, service providers are being paid even better. So this is a way to disempower civil society unless we take this seriously. Great. Thanks for this comment. It fits really well to what Catherine was saying earlier about uh, our title is state society and people in the digital age. And it's about the connectedness between these uh, three parts. And uh, I think this really, really emphasizes the point that uh, we were discussing earlier. You look at me as if you have another yeah. question, Natasha. Well, there's, there's an interesting <laughs> couple of questions talking about the cultural gap. We have to be very um, careful. On the one hand, people are saying some languages are just harder to translate than others, mm. which means that there's less being mm. um, done uh, online in those languages. But also there's a question on what are icebreakers for the magic source of cultural change if the existing culture is rather hostile towards this change? And perhaps um, just this, this wonderful question here, please also keep in the cult cultural gap in mind. In some places, people struggle much more with digital interaction because they value direct personal relations mm. much more where a cup of coffee is necessary for any mm. successful conversation. So which, w do we need to have lots and lots of different conversations going back to that contextualization again? Yeah, I see nodding. I don't know if any of you uh, as a final round for this second uh, theme that we are discussing wants to jump in and I think very valid points, huh? We got nodding. We got, got it. We got it. Lots and, of um, nods. I'm, uh, as your co-moderator, as junior moderator, I'm on time. We're moving to the next <laughs> focus area. And we do have time at the end of the panel to pick up some of these questions again. So you've heard some of them. You can get prepared and we'll throw them at you again towards the end of the session. <laughs> this is Natasha's job then. Okay, excellent. So we have the third focus area that we will be dealing with, as Gia said, internally over the next days. It's uh, the inclusive digital democracy and deliberation. And we also have a question here from the field, from our colleague from Zimbabwe. And the questions uh, we will ask will go to Helani and Najira. So maybe we can see the video. 
Hello, Helani. My name is Nyasha, and I work in Zimbabwe to promote civil society participation. But I'm also a member of the ICT for Good Governance Workstream in Africa. Something that interests me personally is how we can include all citizens, regardless of their literacy level, their income level, or their access to internet in the work that we do. So my question to you is, what can we learn in the governance field from your research at Learn Asia about the integration of low income groups or so-called bottom of the pyramid into digital markets? I also have a very practical question for Nanjira. Nanjira, what is one inclusive digital democracy tool that you would advise us to look into, which is accessible not only to well-connected, high-income citizens, but can also be used by people living in remote areas without a stable internet connection and potentially lower literacy levels? Great. Thanks a lot to Zimbabwe for these questions. Uh, so they're all questions that are also a bit linked to what we discussed earlier about the inclusiveness and also the point Dorothy made. It's, of course, about uh, vulnerable groups. It's also about low-income groups. Mm. can also be about um, people with disabilities. So how can we integrate these groups into our work on democracy? Helani, what can we learn from your experience and uh, how can this uh, integration be a success? Your microphone. Sorry, Catherine. Yeah, sure. That's a great question. She was asking about um, digital markets. I think the motivation is improving lives, irrespective of whether they are integrated into a digital market. So we know that the people at the bottom of the pyramid uh, are often on low wage, low productive, high risk jobs and sectors of the eco economy. One of the ways these digital markets help is by integrating them into global markets and global value chains. We see this in a lot of instances, for example, remote gig work platforms in South Asia, where people are designing logos for American buyers remotely earning higher wages than they would have done otherwise had they sold the same logo production in the country. But to do this, the digital worker needs an affordable and reliable broadband connection, the right skills and a bank account. I think that's in a way what we can do quite easily, even though there are a lot of lots of challenges there. But the long term thing is she also needs a banking system that looks at her small but regular income and offers a formal loan facility so that she can purchase land, buy a house or invest in a business. Because otherwise, while in the short term, she's slightly better off doing this gig work on a monthly or daily basis. In the long term, she is one paycheck away from falling back below the poverty line the moment the next shock hits, like the pandemic. Mm. We see this in agriculture markets, with farmers earning sometimes five times more than their average income by selling traceable agriculture products in the European Union compared to what they would earn in the local market. Mm. But most farmers don't even enter these very high margin global markets because they have no access to the capital they need to invest mm. in order to get, let's say, an organic certification to invest in the tech and RFID that you need to trace a gherkin back to their plot of land or to meet the phytosanitary requirements. Some farmers also don't enter high margin agriculture markets because they are incentivized by poor government uh, policies to keep growing lower crop, uh, lower value crops. Uh, that are highly commoditized because of land policies and regulated commodity prices. So in both these examples, and there are many others, only some of the solutions for the market participation are tech centric. The rest are analog complements, as the World Bank so beautifully put it in one of the former uh, call detail records. The second thing, I think, is the market that is actually digital. That is the market that the bottom of the pyramid and all of us are automatically part of when the moment we get a mobile phone and start using a SIM card and start using the internet. And that is of our data. And it is sort of sometimes something that people unwittingly are part of. We've talked a lot, I think, about the data implications and the rights, but there's also an innovation challenge if we are talking about economic development. Mm. Of the data that is produced by us are only usable by large global platforms 
and little of that economic value comes down to our national or individual levels. Mm -hmm. Even the private and small companies don't have access to the data to innovate. These would create real jobs in real countries for real people. Mm -hmm. So the governance of this has to really be thought through in both these types of very tangible good services markets as well as data markets about what equity means and how these are used for bettering people's lives. Thanks so much, Shalani. Now, I'm almost tempted to ask a further data question into the round, but I know we have, uh, of course, the question that was pre-recorded to Najira, so le let's give that a round, but maybe we uh, then slowly move towards the fourth uh, area that we will be tackling because uh, we will further discuss data issues there as well. And thanks so much for your insights. They again pick up the issue that was said before. I think by Dorothy, we have to look at this holistically and it starts also with different types of opportunities that need to be worked on. So, Najira, uh, you spoke about the risks earlier. Now we have a different question. Can you give us an advice about an effective, inclusive digital democracy tool? I was really surprised when I read this question, I have mm -hmm. to say, because I think it sounds like you're sitting on the democracy tools that we are looking for. And <laughs> <laughs> you, you just tell us and we, we decide together, the, the, the five of you, which one to scale. I wonder what it is and are there so many tools out there and what are criteria to distinguish between tools maybe? When I read Nyasha's question first time around, I even thought it, it would be a fascinating question posed to different folks to see what kind of answer um, will come about. I, I, it's very much framed to give a solution. I'm going to complicate it a bit more and say, I, I, unless somebody, that sounds like a pay to tech company would use to sell their product, that it works for all age groups, it works for all languages, it works for all literacy levels. For me, the answer to that, um, funny enough, is government itself. It would be the best tool because whatever is used uh, and works for whatever subgroup of people, governments ideally, or democracies as we, we like to think about them, are supposed to be in the business of serving people and knowing the people they're serving in a way that if in one particular area, service provision works better in oral language because that's a better way to communicate. They can interoperate that with folks who would use a tool like a digital tool that's SMS-based or otherwise to also bring in their views and news and all that. I don't know as yet that there's that tool that does all of that. And we already have so many digital divides, even among the connected, that we usually don't even pay attention to. So I'm not sure yet that we can think of it as an one tool so much as small sets of tools that work for different groups. And the scale would be in the interoperability of making sure all insights are represented on an equal plane. And that takes me back to democracy itself. But I'd really love to hear from the others if they had a different take on this question. <laughs> the great answer, the uh, government itself. So maybe also if anyone else would like to pick up this question, uh, we haven't heard from Aretha Tracy in a while. I don't know if you attempted or we take the next round with you again. Um, so what would be a good democ digital democracy tool? You have a take on that. I see Tracy working with her mic. Excellent. Tracy, please come in. Sorry, I have, <laughs> Excellent. I have a long, long pause on the, on the, on the mute button. Um, I think the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has actually uh, been a catalyst for at least some innovation that, um, that is useful for um, widening access to, to accountability tools and democracy. So uh, we do see video conferences of parliamentary proceedings, for example, or um, a drive for digitalizing um, the the appointment system for for justice and and caseload management because physically doing that has become almost impossible in many cases uh, because of COVID nineteen. So certain innovations are, are out there and seem to be getting traction this uh, in the last couple of years. Thanks. Um, question of um, achieving justice. Um, someone says achieving justice is key to peace building and how can digital tools and civil society play a role in improving issues of access to justice, dispensation of, dispensation of justice and perhaps the wider discourse on rights. So perhaps that's something that you'd like to pick up on. Yeah, excellent question. So access to justice and maybe having digital tools that enable and open yeah. new doors, uh, even in different settings. Um, uh, digital human rights, I think, was also alluded mm. to. So happy if, if someone wants to take this question. Otherwise, we'll leave it maybe for a second round later on. I'd have a quick intervention. Lani, go ahead. Um, did, uh, justice systems work behind closed doors. 
uh, most of the time. We don't know how decisions are made on who it is imposed. So some of the most innovative work comes from actually understanding how justice is handed out to different groups of people. So data transparency around justice systems, um, access to data that is digitized, analyzable, studyable by researchers and activists, I think would really go a long way. Second, transparency reporting by private sector companies, a lot more than they do currently to reveal what kind of content is deemed threatening by governments and therefore are requested for uh, takedown in a very systematic way that can be analyzed would really help civil society and researchers understand how bad the situation is and then to call for change. That's just one example. Excellent. And it bridges to our last uh, round of discussion uh, following our four fields. And again, afterwards, we still have some time to have a more open discussion because you mentioned that the data transparency in particular in the justice sector could be something long term, but very interesting. Our last uh, yeah, field of discussion that we will be dealing with over the next days is data for sustainable development. And we again have a pre-recorded question coming from Ria. So please play the video. My name is Ria and I'm working at GIZ headquarters in Ashbourne as a gender and human rights sectoral planner. GIZ has been working in many countries with partners on social protection or health systems, many times also with local governments, for example, in the fields of birth registration. Digital technologies offer a wide array of possibilities for registration and identification. But digital ID systems have proven to be also very vulnerable. We read stories of hacks, identity theft, or breaches almost every day. Is there a safe approach to digital ID? And how can GIZ support capacity development in realizing this? Our second question is for Dorothy and Tracy as representatives of a donor organization. And it's a very general question. How can GIZ help to promote fair data markets by strengthening actors in our partner countries to take a seat at the table of global data economies. Thanks a lot to Ria for these questions. So Aretha, the first one, she still had said Thelma. I'm sorry about that. We recorded a few days ago. So I hope you still feel addressed by Thelma, Aretha. Um, so what do you understand by data governance and how can GIZ support its partners addressing their specific needs on data governance? Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so I think maybe starting from the beginning where we are seeing vast amounts of data being collected, stored and transmitted uh, across the globe. So value generation in the digital economy is uh, directly related to the circulation of data, both between countries and uh, between economic actors. Um, so this data exploitation offers vast economic and political opportunities, which makes the data economy a highly contested area. Data governance uh, becomes then important to address the challenges that are presented by the status quo and also the high levels of uncertainty around um, how data is ever evolving and also the, the digital landscape. So I think there um, some elements that we need to be looking at. First, what we need to understand is that data, uh, a single point, piece of data on its own uh, generates very little value by itself. But when data is uh, aggregated, then new knowledge can be created. Also, those that um, uh, generate this data do not, are not in a position most of the times to generate value from it. Value creation, therefore, becomes maximized when data is allowed to circulate. Um, therefore, what we need to do then is to make sure that we, we build trust in the data economy so that we can in increase the value that is derived from this data, but at the same time, that making sure that uh, we are protecting the rights of, Afri of, of Africans. So um, also infrastructure is important to allow data circulation. But I think um, this needs to be accompanied by a design of a governance system and rules that ensure, like I mentioned, uh, the protection of the fundamental human rights of African citizens. 
um, protection of businesses and organizations, uh, we're talking about innovation. They thrive in an environment where there's trust and also legal certainty. Um, I saw a, a report on cybersecurity saying that uh, cyber crimes have cost uh, African economies something around 3.5 billion, and that was for 2017. So we can see how much trust uh, is very important in this area. And then also the other important thing is making sure that we protect uh, the sovereignty of African states and their interests as well. So getting back to the former question on digital IDs, uh, you can see that they are a critical element of organizing and processing data um, and also um, they enable the transaction and interaction in a trusted ecosystem. So Smart Africa has developed a blueprint on digital ID and it has established a concept called what we call the Smart Africa Trust Alliance. This is uh, going to serve as an agile and adaptable solution so that we make sure that there's interoperability between uh, various public and private sector identity schemes. So maybe just to summarize, uh, data governance requires one leadership. It requires an inclusive process. It requires a policy framework that reduce legal uncertainty, also a harmonization of these legal frameworks, and then finding a common approach uh, to barriers around data circulation that we find in locking and retention strategies among, among major economic actors. So talking about also competition law. So these, I think, uh, are the important aspects, also including strong and independent institutions and making sure that also we build technology capabilities to make sure that we enable our data to flow in a trusted and effective way. Wow, that seems like a lot of preconditions that are needed in order to have inclusive, uh, just and development oriented, if I may rephrase it like this, uh, data governance. Um, I wonder if there's more questions coming in well, on this issue. There are generally questions on the change on the change process. So uh, specifically, um, all panelists have been asked to say, how do you overcome resistance to change? And we can go back to that sort of magic source as well. Mm -hmm. It's not specifically for, for data, but we've just heard the use of the word trust. So this is, you know, it's fundamental change. Mm -hmm. Trust and the ecosystems. So I, I think let's pick this up later and uh, turn again to Ria's second question, which was also related to data, but maybe I rephrase it a little bit. It was directed to Tracy and Dorothy. If you remember, it's now been five minutes and we heard uh, <laughs> something, uh, this thick explanation on uh, data governance in between. So um, I think uh, what uh, I remember from Ria's question went into the direction again. So what's important for these two organizations, which are huge players, of course, in policy and development, the World Bank and, uh, and the BMZ, what seems to be important for you uh, when you consider designing data for development initiatives? Uh, where do you stand? What's your interest? Um, and maybe uh, I'll start with Dorothy on that. So in your fields, gender inequality, data for development initiatives, are you at a starting point? We had this earlier also. Are you lo looking at some mature initiatives that you have? What's important for you in this really complex field of data, data governance, data analysis, data sharing, data innovation, as we heard before? It's a thick issue. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Katrin. Um, in fact, I mean, we, we know that the Agenda 2030 underlines time and again how important data is for, for sustainable development. And our um, our endeavors or our efforts to do, to, um, to harness data for development design, data for development initiatives is, of course, um, geared towards um, the, the SDGs and um, and the Agenda 2030. So I think um, one um, condition of of all these uh, programs and projects is uh, that again we will leave no one behind. And uh, in order to not to leave anyone behind, we need to make the um, uh, the beneficiaries and the the vulnerable people visible and this i mean we've talked about this before this only goes uh, with this aggregated data so i think any um, any program any initiative uh, data for development should aim at uh, fostering um, 
the 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 production of disaggregated data for for gender at once but also again i come back to this uh, for persons with disabilities and uh, and so on so if we want to make them visible if we want to make an effort and we want to track progress we we need to have this data uh, the second um point that I would like to make is, uh, and, and here I, I put my human rights hat on, um, is of course the risk of, uh, of misuse of data and uh, the risk uh, to, of, of uh, human rights violations with data. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm happy to report that we have just developed a tool, the GIZ has been very helpful in this, to assess human rights risks in our um, data for development projects. So um, this is a very easy to use uh, project that, that, with a, that guides you through a checklist and then uh, has concrete recommendations. And uh, it will be launched very soon, I understand. So uh, watch this space because there, there is something very helpful coming for the, for the daily practice in, uh, um, in digital rights. Then the last um, point that I would like to make is, is again also the trust and the data protection. Of course, we have a good story to tell. Uh, Germany, the EU is, is among the leaders here uh, as, as regards the, the high standards. Um, so uh, we, we could sort of work on this, and this also has direct implications for gender equality, but I, I would like to, to keep it short. Um, so these are my main points. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, get over to Tracy. Tracy, so this year the World Bank issued Data for Better Lives, WDR, big report. So what's your perspective on the data issue what's what's your advice maybe also what have you learned through your endeavor in designing such a seminal report on this very important issue thanks well before i jump into the question that ria posed let me um, also speak to this issue around um, culture and how do we get change and i just want to get, share with you a short story i had the privilege of working um, in kenya in uh, 2011 so a decade ago where a small group of of um civil society, academic, private sector came together to support the launch of the Kenya Open Data Initiative. And really, this speaks to this point that Halani made about bringing in others outside. And we had a leader at the time who was not a career civil servant, the secretary of ICT, who brought in and had a very consultative approach. So I think this kind of cultural shift is what we mean concretely. So turning um, back to the to the question, I mean, obviously, data governance is key. Our economies are becoming increasingly data driven, and how we how we manage that asset is key, right? To how we um, uh, have managing the risks of misuse, um, as Dorothy pointed to, but also managing the risks of underuse that it's not actually being used for for value creation. So I think these are the the issues that are on the table. And now the gold standards, um, you know, they are uh, not necessarily always applicable to, to the context in which we work. I mean, particularly, as we noted, digital capacity to implement or to enforce rules is, is not the same in, in many of the client countries that we're working in. So making sure that it is maximizing the reuse managing the risks of misuse and building a, a social contract, if you like, that is very much context um, specific. Thanks. Thank you very much. I wonder what our panelists say to the question, could the European Union activities with regard to, oh, it's just, just disappeared. Hold on, I'll find it. Could, um, with regard to Digital Service Act, handling of hate speech, etc., serve as a model as GDPR did? But also understanding, as we've just heard um, from Tracy, that we're also dealing with uh, managing the risks of underuse of data. Is, that, is there a model that we can just use internationally? <laughs> <laughs> I bounce this uh, to the panelists. Uh, and um, let's see, is, is there a model or is there a model evolving that helps shape maybe something jointly that is different? Um, maybe also, I mean, looking again at your functions, I pick you directly, Helani, with uh, your experience on the Global Partnership on Sustainable Data Development. Maybe you want to jump in on that uh, reflection also. Would there be a model? What kind of uh, activities uh, from the EU with regard to the Digital Service Act could be interesting? And, bef oh. and before you come in, Helani, sorry, someone has already said, is GDPR actually a model? I feel it targets much the wrong activities. Sorry, just to mention. <laughs> 
Right. The answer to both are no. I don't think um, we can't ever straight out take GDPR or the Digital Services Act. And in fact, the problems of taking GDPR, which I, by the way, believe is fundamentally an amazing and aspirational goal for all our countries to strive towards. But given where we are, taking GDPR as is is causing so many problems of compliance particularly for the kinds of people in the economy that, who need the kind of government help, small companies who are unable to enter whole service contracts because they are not compliant. So this is a fundamental problem. And we have to take these aspirational, let's say, policy objectives and be able to differentiate and translate this to the context that works. This is not to say GDPR is bad, but it cannot be implemented as is in many of the countries. That's what we heard before. Now we need to contextualize. Um, mm -hmm. Natasha, you have any yeah, other, um, any, or anyone else who wants to join and uh, comment on, on that question? Yeah, I just wanted to, Excellent. to come in. I think it was uh, Tracy who mentioned the issue of context. So, for example, with the issue of GDPR, I agree with Helani that it's a very good uh, aspirational model. But when it comes to Africa, um, and this is what uh, some of our member states were, were, were also mentioning, that it is very costly to implement. And uh, just also uh, uh, building on what Helani said, for example, for um, innovators and startups, it just increases the barrier of entry for them. So we need to look at, um, uh, to benchmark, yes, but then of course, look at our context where we are in terms of um, our economies. So for example, some of the um, the policies, they, they actually uh, uh, hinder um, productivity in some, in, and in some cases also um, kind of form, form barriers in terms of trade amongst the countries. So we really have to look at it. And I'm thinking from, from a, an African point of view, also doing our own research on what kind of policies really work for us and uh, uh, so that we, we, we are informed and not just, um, uh, what is it, shopping from the shelf and implementing. So there's need to really like uh, conduct research and understand where our needs are. Maybe that's one of the key elements of the change that we're talking about as well. Mm. And we were asked for the magic sauce. Mm. Um, so it'd be great to hear from all panellists on that. And maybe one of those is literally, you know, let's not just um, have uh, regulations imposed, but let's develop um, our own contextually apt regulations that we feel the need for. But maybe there are other um, parts of the magic sauce. Mm. So your question goes into that direction. What is in needed institutional to move the institutional? Change? And also, if you have any, if you have any um, comments on where you see international development yeah. cooperation, then that's also something that we need to take. Shall we just take a round? We see you here with the five. I think yeah, you see them as well. And uh, start with, uh, I think Najira is already sitting as if she wants to say something <laughs> on that question. And then we'll just take a round yeah. to Tracy, Aretha, Helani and Dorothy. Um, I must say I'm taken again by the framing of the question. Mm -hmm. The singular sort of like elixir that if we just all drink, the world will be a magical place. Uh, it really, I feel like we, I just want to highlight the danger sometimes of thinking of this as a singular solution, because in one hand, in the digital era, it leads us to solutionism, where everybody then creates a supply to meet this demand for a singular thing, but it's really some form of snake's oil. A lot of what will make digital development actually viable for the different contexts we've spoken to is really taking the time to understand the context in which you're trying to introduce them. And even the humility to figure out, is that the right approach? Am I the right person to bring this um, technology or this uh, solution to a particular area? And this is a really important thing to point out for development practitioners. Are you the right person to go to a rural community in Kenya where I'm from and introduce digital IDs, for example, because you're offering, I don't know, access to water, access to education. Are you, is that the right solution even? You know, the source that we're looking for is that human element that actually does exist within us that leads us to ask in humility and to really figure out how do you go in and listen first, as opposed to coming with solutions and framing and taking that further back upstream and making sure that we're not framing things to limit us into silos where we look for half-baked solutions rather than things that will last. That's, uh, I think, already something great for us as a takeaway for, for the next days. Thanks so much for that. Um, Tracy, you want to uh, answer to that as well? 
Yeah, I think I'll pick up from from where Nanjiro left off, which is to say it is context specific when we're talking about data governance. And maybe one key question that we need to ask ourselves when thinking about the rules and regulations of governance and, and digital solutions rollout in general is, do citizens trust this solution enough to use it? And what rules and regulations need to be in place for that to happen? Because if citizens don't trust it and aren't going to use it, then it really isn't speaking to to the solution that you that you want to bring in. So I think that's the key the key issue right? having rules, regulations, but are they enforced? Are you know even if they are out there and on the books and look great, if people don't think they're really going to be enforced or that their personal data is safe, then they're not going to use it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tracy. Uh, let's continue with the round, unless you have... No, 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 no. I think great. it's excellent. Yeah, Aretha. Yes, um, thank you. So I think what we need to do is start to build from where we are or what is already there. So, for example, um, when we were doing a SWOT analysis of the various legal frameworks uh, on data protection and privacy, we found that um, amongst uh, the data protection laws in Africa, there are a lot of similarities and commonalities so it's not starting from that negative angle of there's no um, harmonization, but what is there? And we start building uh, on it to ensure that we harmonize. I think um, it's kind of a low hanging fruit. What we need to do is also to ensure that uh, our um, regulators, for example, in this regard, data protection authorities, uh, their enforcement capaci capacities are also enhanced and strengthened and uh, also their independence as an institution. Thank you so much, Helani. Unless uh, you want to add to the questions. No, that's fine. Picking up on that last point, I think uh, developing institutional capacity and building institutions is fundamental and in capacitating people. This is as important as investing in technology because the gains in economic development and rule of law can slide back really quickly in the hands of authoritarian regimes and they will use digital technology to do that. So institutional capacity is key. Second, not just digital, but really worry about the analog complements that are needed to make the whole package work, not for the technology just to be rolled out and not used. Third, I would think about the incentives at the ground level, all the way starting at headquarters for funders, uh, project managers who are incentivized to meet disbursement targets occasionally Im impact targets, but there's a huge punishment for cutting back on projects that when you find they're not working on the ground, these are career destroying. And that's a problem. We end up with technology projects that go on for years and don't really give the impact or have unintended consequences. So we really need to have meaningful um, incentives for people who are funding these things to do the right thing. Can I just pick up on the unintended consequences before we go to Dor uh, Dorothea? Because someone's written, does anyone think about the effects on the environment through needed data storage and the devices after they become use, use, um, useless? What about the labour conditions for getting the minerals, the cell phones, etc.? Looking at the whole um, sustainability question. We haven't touched on the environmental side at all. Helani, is that something where you think also think that we're, we're not thinking systemically enough? Absolutely. And this has a lot to do with how government is organized in silos, how funders are organized in silos and just how things work. So, you know, somebody in charge of a technology portfolio will go and talk to their counterparts who handle that. And at best, there might be an environmental impact assessment. But a lot of times, the environmental impact says, well, not a really huge big deal because this is just some back end, whatever. That's the kind of problem. So really thinking about digital as a fundamental infrastructure that impacts every single aspect of government and the economy and having the right people at the table would be a starting point. Right. And perhaps because we're already um, getting to Dorothy, there's actually a question specifically for you. Um, when we're looking at change, um, are the high German and EU standards on data protection hindering speedy digital developments? So if you could look at also how can we um, not only promote the change and the transformation, but also take away things that may be hindering it? I think Thank my you. approach would be to start where we are and having long term goals. So have this in a modular approach of what we can achieve with the tools we have now while creating the pathway 
whether it's developing the capacity, creating the enable environment to reach that GDPR type goal. But we have to start with something now. So to break down achievable goals in the short and the long term. Yeah, maybe pass on to Dorothy also the two questions. Okay, to me, <laughs> thank you. Um, I mean, as, as we've heard before, um, I, I don't think anybody would, would sort of transpose what we have uh, as laws in Europe and in Germany uh, onto uh, a partner country, because um, this, this is neither um, sort of uh, appropriate nor, nor relevant probably. So I think I would think that um, solutions would need to be found um, in the approach of development cooperation, where where it is really relevant to the to the um, people we uh, don't want to leave behind, <laughs> to to repeat myself. So I think the the role for GIZ and for development cooperation would be to involve these people um, in the design of programs and to to listen to them, and not come with uh, technological answers. To what what seems to be a technological question, but as as Nanjira again has said so so good, it's, it's really about humility and and the human element. Um, one still one one technological uh, approach that that is important for us that I would like to add is sort of uh, to promote the use of open data rather than uh, taking. Uh, packages of, of uh, big companies, because it does give citizens um, greater control over data and it can promote the trust that, that we need to use these, uh, these applications also and increase trans transparency in governance. So um, uh, to, to bring back that sort of um, democratic element also to, to, to the table and to, to cooperation. Thanks. Thanks, Dorothy. I look at Natasha. Well, there's just some really nice stuff out, um, out there that we should read and just take on board. Like, we should try to push the use of free tools. There are good ones out there. We're just not used to use them. Mm. That's good for sustainability. And remember, form follows function. We uh, Digital solutions mm. are too often seen as a goal in itself. So there's some great wisdom mm. also in WiseAmbly. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, so it's almost impossible, of course, to round up. It'd be great to continue this uh, discussion with you. Maybe we meet uh, in this round at another place in time. We'd definitely like to have some sort of follow up with you and we'd be super interested in sharing with you what we now over the next days as GIZ uh, during the internal section of this conference make out of your good comments and advice. And let me just briefly summarize two or three points. So we spoke about the digital capacities and came to the point that culture matters so strongly in making these capacities develop and grow. We spoke about the social cohesion, peace building in the digital era. And we heard a lot about the divides and how actually structural divides are often reproduced in the, in the digital sphere and that we have to work on the structural issues in order to overcome this. We spoke about the inclusive digital democracy and deliberation. And uh, there, uh, for me, one of the takeaways was we have to motivate ourselves towards, of course, improving life. It's not about solutions for the sake of finding solutions, but it's about something that makes our work more effective, better, and that changes the life. And I also like very much what was said, the best tool is the government, if it is <laughs> democratic and functioning in the way that, uh, of course, it allows for... Uh, democratic digital participation. And lastly, we spoke a lot about data. We heard how important it is to disaggregate data to better know what we talk about and to find data governance uh, mechanisms that are contextualized and that are apt for the situation. So I have a lot of takeaways. I'm really happy with this panel. Mm. Um, I thank you so much for your insights and, and all, your, all, all your open words also to us. And I hope uh, you also benefited from our panel. Maybe you also made new connections because uh, one thing we were always saying, this is also about partnerships, connecting building new relationships and uh, thanks so much and um, I think it was a great all-female panel with <laughs> even us all-female moderators. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But uh, let's see, I think this will change a little bit now over the course of the conference and thanks again if I have five seconds to our voices from the field, to our colleagues, unfortunately, uh, our colleague from Indonesia, the technical uh, prerequisites didn't work, but also thanks so much for them for posing their questions because they come really from the practitioner side and they wanted to engage with you on those questions. And I think we have tried to do our best to do so. <laughs> so 
Again, I think this, these three people in the studio can give an applause. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks so much. Have a great day. I don't know if you have to Let say just, something. I'll say no, one more thing. Um, and that one more thing is, has everything to do with our bodies and not much to do with our minds. So if I could invite everybody, before we take a break, just to stretch. You don't Me have too. to, but I can tell you, it's going to do you a world of good. Oh, stretch up. Then you might want to just stretch over to the left. Oh, our panelists are also stretching. Thank you. Yeah, please, we need you. And let's stretch over to the other side. And now really carefully, if you go forward, oh, crack, 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 crack. Oh, that's good. And then keep your arms up for a minute. And then you're going to drop them in a minute and feel your shoulders getting that lovely gravitational pull. <sighs> well done, Natasha. <laughs> okay, we're taking a break now. See you back at four o'clock where we have so much more inspiration shooting stars for you. See you at four.